So I'm just showing you a picture of our building so that people will believe me when I say there's more to Louisville than the Kentucky Derby, which as most people know, <laughs> happened on Saturday um, here in Louisville. And that's kind of what we're known for. So um, this is actually the building I work in and um, it's, a, it's a brand new, about a 10 year old building um, that we are grateful to be in. Today, I'm gonna to give you um, an overview of some of our work with sphingolipids in cisplatin-induced uh, kidney injury. And I'm gonna give you some background on acute kidney injury um, and um, some work that's published on sphingolipids and cisplatin-induced kidney injury, as well as ceramide metabolites and how those metabolites of ceramide impact AKI. So um, we're, my lab predominantly now studies acute kidney injury, and there's three types of, of kidney injury. There's those um, events that occur upstream of the kidney, and those tend to limit blood flow to the kidney and then damage the kidney that way. There's those that, that occur downstream of the kidney, so things that block urine excretion, and then there's direct damage to the kidney, and that's the type of kidney injury that my lab studies. The reason for that is because most of the kidney injury caused by reduced blood flow or reduced output can be solved by simply restoring blood flow or restoring urine output. However, intrinsic kidney injury, um, specifically acute tubular necrosis, um, there's currently a lack of treatments for, for all types of kidney injury. Um, and so this is a big problem, especially now and relevant with COVID-19 as acute kidney injury is a big uh, problem um, and associated with mortality um, and with infections like COVID-19. But it's also a big problem with drugs. Um, one of the main, um, most people that do work in pharmacology and toxicology will be able to tell you that one of the main things you screen for um, when putting drugs on the market is kidney injury. And these are a list of drugs that cause um, acute kidney injury. On the left side, you'll see those that cause it in 30% or more of patients. And on the right, um, 10 to 30% of patients, these are um, drugs that actually are used um, as chemotherapy agents. Um, and that's the type of kidney injury that my lab is specifically interested in. And we mainly study cisplatin. Um, and like I said before, that is a big problem because it causes kidney injury in 30% or more of patients even today. Cisplatin is a really effective chemotherapeutic. When it was approved in 1978, the survival rate of testicular cancer was 10%, and now it's above 80%, and it's the primary chemotherapy used for that treatment. Um, the, the ability to reduce term of burden with cisplatin is limited by its nephrotoxicity. So the thought is this, if we could protect the kidney prophylactically, or if we could give something to patients after their cisplatin, then we could actually prevent um, what's seen in some patients that don't have overt toxicity, they'll still go on to develop chronic kidney disease. So my lab actually studies both forms of cisplatin injury, the acute form, which I'm gonna to talk to you about today, as well as um, the form where it's very low levels of injury that are not, that are subclinically detected, but go on to uh, drive chronic kidney disease. And that is a, a new model that my lab developed, and I'm not gonna go into that today because of time. Typically with cisplatin in the, kid, in the clinic though, um, you'll get patients and they, they will actually pre-screen patients. So patients that um, obesity, diabetic nephropathy, um, and other um, um, comorbidities that they will pre-screen and actually give less nephrotoxic drugs like carboplatin. Unfortunately, these are often for most types of cancer, less efficacious at treating the cancer. But even in pre-screening, 30% of those patients will go on to develop acute kidney injury. Sometimes there's renal recovery, um, sometimes there's not. And these patients are permanently removed from the chemotherapy. Um, and um, which is not good for the cancer treatment. And some of them go on for dialysis and some unfortunately don't make it. Cisplatin induced acute kidney injury has been studied for, for some time now. And um, the current model that is um, typically used is a, pretty, is a single high dose of cisplatin. And we know from studies involving that model um, that many biologies occur, including inflammation, reactive oxygen species, cell death, um, including apoptosis, but also other forms of cell death. Um, autophagy plays a role, both good and bad, and cell cycle arrest. These are all processes which this group can appreciate um, that sphingolipids have been implicated in. 
Um, normally I have to go into what is a single lipid with this group, I don't. Um, but what I do wanna show you is um, if you look at the basics of single lipid metabolism, what my group studies um, were what we were studying at first, and then science kind of pushes you in the direction of the data was, you know, what is the role of ceramide in driving cisplatin induced kidney injury? And what is the role of the ceramide metabolites um, in those processes? And so these are the main uh, processes that we study. And we studied them in the past. We've studied them um, both glucosal ceramides and ceramides and sphingosine in a variety of kidney diseases. And so in collaboration with Tammy Nulling, we studied them in lupus nephritis. We've done work in diabetic nephropathy, um, but now we're mainly focused on acute kidney injury and the role of ceramide in, it, in its metabolites in those processes that are involved in cisplatin-induced acute kidney injury. And the hypothesis is there's a really a fine balance and any deviation from homeostasis is, is not good um, in, the, in, in regards to biology. So how do we study, um, in the model I'm gonna show you, um, it's a model of acute kidney injury. Again, it's um, a single high dose of cisplatin and the peak of injury is about at 72 hours. Cisplatin, by the way, is cleared rather rapidly in mice. Um, and so it's fully out of the system by the time we get peak injury. But typically you will study uh, what's going on at peak injury or before, and the mice are, um, are euthanized at about four, three to five days after treatment. If you look here, we measure the ceramides in the kidney cortex. And as you can see, there's an increase in both short and long chain ceramides, 72 hours following cisplatin dosing. So we did work, and this was um, actually collaborative work back when I was um, in Lena Obeid's lab. Um, and we looked at a variety of enzymes and what could be driving these ceramide increases. And so um, we looked, um, this was Maria Hernandez did this work looking at long chain ceramide synthase activity. And we found that that was increased in the kidney cortex of um, cisplatin treated mice. And back when Chris was a wee one, a, a postdoc, a wee postdoc, he did work to look at both acid and neutral sphingomyelinase activity and only acid was increased in the cisplatin um, treated uh, kidney corn testes from the cisplatin treated mice. And so we did a study where we uh, pre-treated mice with inhibitors of um, serine palmitol transferase because um, as we know, treating mice with fumonacin can be toxic and the inhibitor of um, acid sphingomyelinase, amitriptyline. And when we pre-treated these mice with these inhibitors, um, we found that um, as opposed to uh, the vehicle controls, the mice treated with um, the inhibitors in cisplatin didn't see those increases in ceramides. So it blocked the increase of the ceramide that occurs with cisplatin. So what happens with the kidney? Um, there's many different ways to measure um, kidney injury. I'm just showing you one piece of data. This is published. Um, and that is serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen. And as you can see, there's an, a, an overt increase in both serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen. Um, and this is because the kidney actually freely filters these and when it's not filtering, they will build up in circulation. Whereas when you inhibit the ceramide increase with these two inhibitors, that blocks the serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen increase. However, um, one of the things that I want to point out is that it's not just ceramide going up. What happens with the other species? And what we noticed was when we looked at the other sphingolipids, we had measured the, actually this should say hexosal ceramides, I apologize. But when we measured the hexosal ceramides, we found that they were also increased with cisplatin and they were um, not increased with the inhibitors of ceramide synthesis. You block the ceramide synthesis and you block them as well. So we don't know what the damage is due to. So is so are we not getting damage to the kidney when we use amitriptyline and myriosin because we're not getting ceramide or because we're not getting glucosal ceramide or both? So to address this question, we teamed up um, with James Shaman, who at the time was um, putting forth um, a drug that inhibited glucosal ceramide synthase for FDA approval um, for the treatment of Gaucher disease. And C10 was the sister drug that was different in um, length by two carbons. Um, and it was the backup plan if that first drug didn't get FDA approval. But he was able to give that to us. And we were able to, um, this is actually a really great inhibitor. It works in sub, like very, very sub 
uh, animal range. So we were able to treat mice with C10 and then treat them with cisplatin. And here we um, treated before and after. And I'm not sure why my student did that. That was just what she, we only had a certain amount of drug. And so she figured she would um, set the system up to inhibit the glucosal ceramide synthase um, as best as possible. So what she found when she inhibited glucosal ceramide synthase was that um, as predicted, you know, with that, with the cisplatin, you get an increase and the inhibitors blocked that increase. So what happens with the ceramides? And what we found actually um, surprised Jim um, was that we still got the ceramide increase. And in fact, we got more of a ceramide increase. And that would suggest that it's because the ceramide generated is used to make the glucosal ceramide. So when you block that, it builds up the ceramide. So what happens with the biology in the kidney? And when we measured kidney function, again, by blood urea nitrogen or um, KIM-1, which is a, um, an injury molecule specifically made in the proximal tubules, it's another uh, marker of injury. We see that when you block glucosal ceramide synthase, the damage is actually worse. So this would suggest that the ceramide is actually likely contributing to the injury and that glucosal ceramide synthesis in this model is allowing the system to buffer the ceramide levels um, and inhibit ceramide's ability to exacerbate injury. If you're interested in the biologies measured, I um, point you to that 2017 JLR paper. So, you know, we blocked ceramide synthesis and we, we improved the outcome. We blocked ceramide's ability to be um, uh, metabolized to glucosal ceramides and we made things uh, worse. So what happens at another arm of ceramide metabolism? And we looked specifically, we were interested in neutral ceramidase. And this interest actually came for a variety of reasons, but one of the major reasons for this interest was that uh, there was a piece of work that was put out by um, Tatiana Gutz's lab, where she looked at the role of neutral ceramidase in injury in traumatic brain injury. And many of the same pro biological processes occur in traumatic brain injury as in the kidney um, and other organs as well that are injured. And so we had thought, well, this might be one of the ceramidases to look at with regards to acute kidney injury. Um, and so we hypothesized that it might protect the mice from cisplatin induced AKI because of her work, even though that is counterintuitive to uh, what you would think with regards to the lipid metabolism. So again, we obtained um, from Ashley Schneider, um, who had the Rick Proya generated neutral stream based knockout mice and that crossed them fully onto the C57 background. And so she provided us uh, with these mice um, and we looked in wild type on knockout and actually the heterozygotes, but I'm not gonna be showing you that here. I think I can't remember if the data is in here, um, but we looked in male mice um, at eight weeks of age. We've also done female mice, but again, I'm not showing you that here. Um, and we looked at the cisplatin induced injury at 72 hours. And you'll see we're using a different dose of the cisplatin. And we did that because it's, if you use this dose, it's a dose where if you see a worsening of injury or an improvement of injury, you can see it at this level either way. Um, and so, that's why she used the um, 20 mix per keg. And so what we found, sorry, was um, that the cisplatin, I mean, sorry, the neutral ceramidase knockout mice were protected from kidney injury. And that's true whether you use blood urea nitrogen or serum, serum creatinine as your measurement or NGAL, which is actually a urinary marker of kidney function. Um, it's actually not made by the kidney, but it's filtered by the kidney. So when the kidney's not filtering, it does, or, it doesn't get excreted in the urine. And that's now FDA approved as a marker of kidney injury. Um, and so um, we know, and I'm not showing the data here, but um, we, when you inhibit neutral ceramidase, there's less cell death. Um, and then we had a postdoc in the lab, um, Kumran Sundaram, that had done a piece of work where he was looking at the role of neutral ceramidase in cells that were um, treated with a variety of, of injuries that would induce nutrient and energy deprivation induced cell death or necrosis. And what he found in this piece of work was that um, neutral ceramidase knockout protected cells from these injuries by upregulating autophagy and actually mitophagy. And so um, this is actually something other groups have seen with neutral ceramidase knockout or inhibition and upregulation of autophagy. And so this was not new to just our group. And so we looked in the kidneys and we found that autophagy was increased in the kidney cortices of neutral ceramidase knockout mice. 
One thing to point out was another um, uh, major person in the kidney injury group, um, uh, Zeng Dong at, down in, um, in Georgia, had found that when you inhibit autophagy, it makes um, injury worse. So autophagy in this model plays a protective role. So we we hypothesized that that's why these mice lacking neutral ceraminase were protected from cisplatin-induced kidney injury. So my student, Sierra, um, uh, Sophie Sears, went on to inhibit autophagy. And in this experiment, she inhibited it with the drug chloroquine. And when she inhibited it with chloroquine, we didn't see much of a change in the blood ure urea nitrogen, but she did see a major change in the kidney injury markers of KIM-1 and NGAL, um, which are actually more sensitive markers than blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine. Um, and so this would suggest that the neutral ceramidase knockout mice are protected, at least in part, by increased autophagy. And she went on to look at a variety of markers in the kidney. Um, and just for time, I'm not um, showing that here. So in conclusion, um, the, the inhibition of ceramide generation through single myelinase, acid single myelinase, or serum palmitoyl transferase protects from injury. And we think that's through um, blocking the ceramide because when you prevent ceramide metabolism to glucosal ceramides through inhibition of glucosal ceramide synthase, injury is worse. Inhibition of, of neutral or knockout of a neutral ceramidase um, actually protects, and um, I'm not showing the lipids here because the lipid changes were actually um, inconclusive. We weren't able to detect actual changes in lipids, and, and that could be for a variety of reasons that I can discuss uh, with the group if they're interested. But we really think that looking at these targets um, in the context of cancer is actually extremely important. And so that's actually what my group is looking at now. We're, we're layering on the comorbidities of aging as well as cancer using genetically engineered mouse models. We're also looking at um, sphingolipids in our uh, new repeated dosing model of cisplatin induced low levels of injury. Um, that models those 70% of patients that don't show any overt changes, but do go on um, a portion of them to have chronic kidney disease. Um, and hopefully we've just uh, recently developed a pig model of, of cisplatin induced um, acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. And so hopefully someday when some of the, um, uh, the medicinal chemists in this group uh, develop some good inhibitors, they'll be willing to send them our way to do some preclinical pig trials. So I want to acknowledge the people that were involved in this work, um, both, both my current lab members. Um, Sophie Sears has really done a lot of work with um, the neutral ceramidase knockout mice and um, inhibiting autophagy through various mechanisms, both in this model and our other uh, cisplatin models. And I need to thank my other um, PhD students, Austin Kruger, Andrew Orwick, Nick Hoffman, and Doug Sephora, who has just graduated um, MD-PhD. Um, and then my former lab members, Tess Dupre, which did a lot of work um, in, this, in this model, as well as uh, Subathra and uh, Kumran that did former work. Um, I need to thank uh, Maria Hernandez and Chris Clark and Ashley Schneider um, that worked with me in the early stages of this project, and Lena and Yusuf, um, who have been phenomenal supporters, as well as my collaborators, Levi Beverly and the rest of his lab, the Lipidomics Corps at MUSC, and James Shaman for his drug, and of course, funding, because without it, we are dry and barren and can't do our work. So with that, I'd love to take some questions.